Why, hello there, and welcome to another rendition of Beyond the Baton. So, cool. Right, we'll just dig right in, because there's a lot to talk about. Uh, this week, we'll be talking about the Baroque time period, because for the last many weeks, we've been focusing on non-traditional string genres, which means all of the fun stuff, basically radio music, right? Rock, pop, indie, alternative, hip hop. Uh, we did dance and electronica. We did Latin. So that's not typically stuff that we play in orchestra. But this week, we're going into the meat and potatoes of what we normally do, and that is Baroque music. It starts in 1600. It goes until 1750. But it's not the first thing. Obviously, music has been critical to humanity since, well, you know, forever. Um, and I think that was the question we actually asked during the dance uh, dance week was what came first, the music or the dance? And music's always been around for humans, as far as we can tell. Um, but music didn't really start to take shape until ancient Greece. Um, philosophers and mathematicians uh, actually studied music and actually thought about it and talked about it and tried to discover what it really was. Uh, the great philosopher Plato was a big figure in this, and Pythagoras, yes, like the Pythagorean theorem, that guy, um, are important figures in the development of music. Plato sort of gave us the meaning, like why have it? And Pythagoras actually started figuring out what notes were, how to develop it, how to make it work. And in order to do that, we need tuning systems. We needed a way to standardize music so that everybody could play together, whether or not you're from Athens, or if you're from Sparta, or if you're from Rome, or from England, we have to have something that we can all agree on so when we get together, we can all play music together. So that's Pythagoras. He invents a system of notes based on numeric ratios. These ratios, these fractions, are based on the frequencies of vibrations. Now, these sound like big science terms, and they are, but if you really think about it, Think of your strings. When you play them, you can see them vibrate. Those vibrations are what cause sound. It's actually making the air move at a certain speed. And if you measure all of those vibrations, like how many uh, vibrations per second you get, you get thousands of them, right? But um, that's what creates sound. And that's what Pythagoras does. He starts with a pitch. Right. And if we're going to go like all super mathy, I will say that pitch is X. And um, he said that if there was a second note and it vibrated twice as fast at a ratio of two to one for every one time pitch X vibrates, pitch Y uh, vibrates twice. That would be considered an octave and it would have the same note name. So think of like A's when we, we tune, we tune to A440. And that's what that means. 440 hertz is vib vibrations per second. If you have a note that's vibrating twice that fast at 880 times per second, that's also an A, but it's the next highest A. Neat, right? And then if you take that ratio, 2 to 1, and you start breaking down all the little things in between that octave, that's how we get the ratios for all of the other notes and why all the other notes exist. Pythagoras' system looks like this, and that's not very clear. There's a lot of not great fractions. I mean, 243 30 seconds, 81 sixteenths. You know, these are not the easiest fractions to see or to figure out or to try and reduce, and you can't. Um, it's not the best, and um, it actually creates music that would sound strange to us today, um, and we'll get into that in just a second. And because it would sound strange, People eventually said, you know, we need a better system. So there are actually many different types of tuning systems out there that we can use. Um, but the one that we use now is called equal temperament. Um, it creates half steps that are about the same distance or the same ratio from one to another. And that's how we have half steps on the piano, half steps on our instruments. Um, it's what we use today, but it's not what was used back then. And because these tuning systems changed over time, the way music sounded also changed. In the medieval times, from about 500 to 1400, 
and the Renaissance from 1400 to 1600, the music that was written and played would be based on these fractions, right? On these like weird things that, that don't match up well. And it would sound a bit odd to us because it would work in some key signatures, but not for all of them. So, for example, if you have a lute or a guitar, basically, or a harpsichord, an early version of a piano, and it's all tuned so that if you play in G major, it's in tune, that's great. It'll sound wonderful. But if that piece of music changes key to, let's say, A major, which is only a whole step higher, or F major, which is a whole step lower, that music is not going to sound good. It's not going to all work because the ratios were designed for G not for A or F. So the ratios, the fractions from all of the notes would be wrong because they're based on the wrong number, the wrong frequency for X, or in this case, G. So you couldn't really change key, which made things kind of basic. You couldn't do much with the music. Equal temperament changes that. But it was not fully developed until around 1585, or in other words, just before the Baroque time period. And with this equal temperament, this is the one where all the half steps were equal to each other. You could compose music in every single key without it sounding out of tune. So you could have a lute or a harpsichord. You wouldn't have to tune it in G major. You could just tune it. And every key that you would play would be in tune with itself, which is, you know, a good thing. And composers like this because it gives composers new options. It allows them to change keys more often and make it sound good. And because of this, a whole new era of music composition began. And that's the Baroque. It starts at about 1600, which is about 15 years after this new equal temperament system is developed. And we get brand new things. So, Baroque. This term actually is a Portuguese word. Barroco, which means misshapen pearl, which doesn't sound very musical. It's not. Um, and in fact, it doesn't sound very nice. And it's not. Uh, the people in the Baroque time period didn't name it this. People that came after the time period named it because they looked back and they saw these long melodies and these weird key changes all over the place because composers could do that. And so, of course, they did. Um, and then there's all the trills. And they started making fun of it and, you know, calling it a misshapen pearl. And that name, that like funny, we're making fun of you nickname stuck. And now we still call it the Baroque time period. Uh, I mentioned trills. Here's an example of trills. 13 different kinds of them that were popular and in use during the Baroque time period. Um, we only use a few of them today, but this just gives you a taste of the music that is going to come. And it's quite spectacular to hear all of these trills, but it does get a little bit extra, a little bit over the top. And no wonder people that came after this time period stopped doing it. But that's probably the first thing that makes it Baroque. Um, trills, there are so many trills or ornaments, uh, trills that go up, trills that go down. And this is just a big thing. They happen a lot of times at the end of the musical phrase or the musical sentence. And also, depending on the composer, they would show up in the middle of the phrase, too. Um, here's a piece of music. And there are all of the ornaments. Some of them are trills. Some of them are mordants. Some of them are trills and mordants. Um, this is a piece by Francois Couperin, which has 21 of these ornaments in the first nine measures. Um, and it just keeps going on and on from there. Um, I guess it's important to say that uh, he was trying to sound like a bird in this particular piece, but he also uses trills in all of the other pieces that he wrote, writes, and lots of other Baroque composers do the same thing. So this is not a shock to see all of these sort of ornaments. Another thing that happens in the Baroque time period are the notes. In fact, 16th notes. Um, composers will start writing active melodies, so like Lots of notes, lots of things going on. And these notes would be 16th notes. Um, and it sort of, you know, goes along with the trills. The trills are extra and flashy. And all of these 16th notes are also going to be extra and flashy. You need to do something to make it extra decorated. And we'll talk about why that is in just a minute or two. Um, but, you know, 
other time periods use trills and other time periods use 16th notes, but it wasn't quite the same. Like Baroque, they, they were like, they were really doing it. And you can see it all over the place. Here's a piece by Bach. Here's a different piece by Bach in uh, you know, his actual handwriting. That's what Bach's handwriting uh, looked like. Uh, here's a piece by Telemann with a bunch of 16th notes. Here's the famous Canon in D by Pachelbel. Um, there you see 16th notes all in the middle. There's just lots of 16th notes, whether the music is fast or slow. Um, all of these pieces actually are on the slower side, and you see all these 16th notes. Um, they're just there. You're going to find them in the Baroque time period. But that's not the most important thing. Yes, there are trills. Yes, there are 16th notes. It's easy to look at Baroque music and go, oh, look, trills and 16th notes. But the most important thing that Baroque gives us is the concept of a key signature. And that's because of that equal temperament. Bass lines are starting to be written that outline chords that are moving in a certain fashion. They would start in a home key or on a home note, or if we use that uh, that math thing, you know, with X, we're starting on X, then we do stuff, we go further away from X, and then we bring it back to X. And X, whether it be A or F sharp or G, that's going to be our home key. And so this use of key signatures is a brand new thing in the Baroque. This harmony that goes to and from this home note or the root note of the key, that's that's the big thing that the Baroque time period is going to give us. Before the Baroque time period, there was a sonata. During and after the Baroque, it's now sonata in a key signature, sonata in G, let's say. So that's the big stuff for the Baroque. And of course, there's more stuff, um, especially at the beginning of this. There's a lot of innovation going on, but these are the three big things that we get from the Baroque time period. So the question next becomes, who played this? Composers are using all these new styles and new innovations, but what were the groups actually doing? Like, what were the groups in the first place? Well, we have to talk about where and why music's being played. The two big places where composers would be employed would be through the church and through royalty. So the Catholic Church and kings and queens, essentially. Uh, church music is primarily performed in a church, as you might expect, uh, with a choir and with an organ accompaniment. Organs were um, often in churches, usually nowhere else. So a lot of organ music uh, was accompanying choirs, sort of being big and grand and, and filling the parishioner with the, with the spirit of God. Eventually, of course, um, there is music that's written for organ. It's not church-centered, um, but a lot of stuff in the Baroque time period is going to be church and an organ. Um, a lot of the hymns that we get, so hymns are four-part uh, church, uh, sorry, four-part uh, songs for choirs sung in church, uh, soprano, alto, tenor, bass. Um, they're composed during this time, and the big, like, original gangster, the OG, is Bach. Uh, he was just tremendous. We'll talk about him a little bit later, too. But music happens outside of church also, and this is called secular music, uh, music that's not for church is secular. And so basically this is going to be people for like the royalty, kings and queens, or other people with a lot of money. Organ is generally not used because not many castles have organs. Uh, if you're playing music in a town square, there's no organ. So organ is not as often used. And what these musicians are going to be doing is entertaining like at a party. Uh, probably like a dance or a dinner party, sort of as background music. Um, and eventually over time, we do have music just for the sake of listening to music, you know, going to a concert hall and seeing music just to enjoy it without eating dinner, without trying to do a whole bunch of dance steps to it. And this changes, of course, over time. At the beginning of the broke time period, the instrument groups would be like, hey, I have an instrument, you have an instrument, let's play music. But by the end, composers were starting to say, I want a violin to play this line. I want an oboe to play this line. I want a cello to play this line. And so the score would actually tell you what instruments were in your group. And that sort of leads us to all the stuff we know today. Orchestras, symphony orchestras, bands, choirs, things like that. It starts in the Baroque time period. These ensembles would basically have two types of instruments, bass instruments and melody instruments, so bass and treble, right? Uh, the bass instruments, they're going to be things like the bassoon or bass recorders. I think we all know the recorders that we learn to play in elementary school, um, but they are a whole big family of instruments. There you see that big bass recorder. That's going to play the lowest notes. Uh, there's a thing called a serpent, which sort of goes along with bassoons, um, a sackbut, 
a great name for an early trombone, um, and then cello and string bass that we, we know and like today. These instruments would also be joined by something that could play chords, many notes at once, like the harpsichord, uh, like an early version of a piano, or maybe a lute, which looks sort of like a, a guitar with a sort of crooked neck. And these two instruments, the harpsichord or the lute, that would be playing the chords are called the basso continuo, literally the continuous bass. So you'd have like a serpent playing a bass line, and then you would have the harpsichord mirroring the bass line with the left hand and then adding chords on top of it. So that's part of the Baroque ensemble, the basso continuo with their bass instrument. Of course, the other aspect of the ensemble are the treble instruments or the melody instruments. They're going to be playing the melody and then the harmony that goes along with it. These are going to be other recorders. You see the higher pitches, the smaller recorders on the right. Uh, these also look like uh, early flutes. Um, oboes and crumb horns are these funny looking things that eventually do turn into the oboes and clarinets we know today. Um, we have early versions of trumpets. But to be honest, the big instrument family that was popular in the Baroque time period was the string family and specifically the instrument of the violin. And it becomes the age of the violin, let's be honest. And that's because the violin can do so much. It's a very flexible instrument, and it becomes very popular amongst composers and amongst listeners and players. Um, it's sort of the big thing. It's actually like the biggest instrument probably until about, oh, I'd say the 1800s, when piano makes a big run for it, and then 1950s guitar takes over. But in the Baroque time period, it's the age of the violin. It can play fast notes, very complex parts. It could also play long, slow, sustained notes. It didn't require breath like a trumpet or a sack butt, right? So you could just play forever, basically, until your arm fell off. So the sounds would be never ending, and composers would use that quality. So violins, violas, cellos, basses, all the instruments in the string family were an ideal choice for composers because the sound would never stop. And it was great. And because of this, because more composers were using it, more people were playing it, we needed more of them. And there were two big families, um, I guess not big families, small families doing big things. And they were both based out of Italy. One was the Stradivari family, one was the Grunari family. And what they would do is just make instruments. That's all they did. And they made some of the best instruments around. And even to this day, they are some of the best instruments. And because there are so many of these being made, it's not just the Stradivari family and Guineri family. Everybody else is making them too. That's how we get to be violin is the king of the Baroque time period. And a lot of people use them. And some of the best writing comes from this time period. And all of the music that comes later for the violin is based on the kind of writing that is done in the Baroque. Um, for example, Vivaldi wrote at least 230 just for solo violin, uh, 230 concertos just for violin. So it's a pretty big deal. He also wrote concertos for viola and cello and two violins and viola and cello and two cellos. Um, lots of things all because of the violin. To this day, the Stradivarius violins sell for literally millions, multiple millions of dollars, more than some houses. And probably the most famous violinist ever was Niccolo Paganini. He actually played a Grenari instrument that he called the cannon because it was so loud. And, and that's the cannon there. So Stradivari and Grenari are two names that probably all string players should know just because their instruments are still around and are still considered the best. It's the age of the violin. So what kind of music are these instruments playing? Yeah, the sack butt and the flutes and the oboes are playing too, but the string family is starting to lead the way. Church music has its own sound, organ and choir. But secular music, the non-church music, also had many different styles and genres as well. A large majority of Baroque music is based on dance music. And that should make sense because groups originally were being hired to perform at galas or balls or dances or parties. And they would have to play for dances and party music. So they would play a bunch of things that, if you look at it, they're literally dances. Aleman, Courant, Saraban, the Jig, uh, Gavat, Beret, Minuet, Waltz, Hornpipe. Um, these are just all dances, these types of dances. And to this day, there are lots of pieces of music that are just called Jig or Aleman. And you can't really tell which one's which because Bach wrote bunches and bunches of these. And you don't really know what it is unless it's part of a bigger work. And that's just because it's based off of dance music. Now, eventually, 
over time, people would start writing music just for the sake of writing music instead of being to accompany dance. But even though that's the case, they are not very inventive yet with their titles, and they still just call it whatever it is. So, oh, this is an alamond, but there's no dance, but we'll still call it an alamond. Oh, this is a waltz. We'll call it waltz. But no one's actually going to be dancing to it, but the names stick. So it's something that actually stays with us for quite a long time. The problem with this is that dance music is actually very short, and it's designed for dancing, so we need people to relax, to allow them to rest. In this time period, uh, there's no air conditioning, of course. Men are wearing three-piece suits or more, and they're usually made out of wool. So they're very heavy. They're very thick. It's very hot. Men even wear wigs at this time. Women are wearing big ball gowns. And so if they're dancing too long, uh, their smells are not going to be the best. So all of these dances are actually quite short to accommodate the dancer, so they don't stink up the joint, basically. So as composers want to make more music for the concert hall, we're taking these dance styles and we're making them more substantial. We're adding extra notes to individual pieces and individual parts. And then groups would start to play dances back to back. They would play in an alemand and then a karant and then a saraban, back to back to back, just so it's a longer piece of music. And so you have a big piece of music with a bunch of little things in the middle and when you start doing this, you have a bigger piece with small segments. These segments are called movements, and the big thing is called a suite. And it sort of leads us to eventually what becomes the symphony. And the symphony is even based on some of these dance, uh, these dance movements, and for a long time even contained the name. Oh, it's a minuet and trio in this symphony. But it all comes from these suites. The next thing composers would do is uh, start writing for specific instruments just to show off that instrument or to show off the player of that instrument. And depending on where they are, like literally where they are, where they're playing, that would dictate what would be going along with the soloist. So if they're playing in a small place, they would have maybe a soloist with a basso continuo, so maybe a cello or a bass and a harpsichord. So you maybe have three people playing and this is called a sonata, so soloist with basso continuo. But if you're in a larger place and you have more people literally to work with, you could have an orchestra playing along with your soloist. And if you combine an orchestra with a soloist, you get something called a concerto. And we still have both of these forms to this day. The weird thing about the Baroque time period is they're still figuring all this stuff out. So this idea of performance practice is something that we look at now that we're living in the later than Baroque times, and we look back and say, well, how did they actually do that? Well, it was being developed at the time. String players were not using vibrato. In this time period, they were going for pure sounds. Remember, they were still figuring out how to make the tuning systems work. So they want pure tones. So they wouldn't do vibrato because vibrato is making a pitch go in and out of tune very quickly, so they're not going to do that. Instead, the way they added that emotional quality to the music was adding all those ornaments. So that's where these trills come in, right? Because we have to add something to the music to give it a little bit extra. And then the other thing that players would do would be actually to improvise. They would take these trills, and like you saw, there were 13 different types of trills, they would start adding their own trills. And maybe at the end of the trill, they would add a couple extra notes. And then the next time it happened, they would add a few more notes. And they would just make it up on the spot. So this would be truly improvised parts. And this would sort of go over into the solo. So in a cadenza of a solo, you would have the soloist playing with the orchestra. The orchestra would stop to allow the soloist a chance to play by themselves just to show off some more. And they would make it up on the spot. So it would be like a huge moment just for the player to do their own thing. And to this day, cadenzas still can be improvised, uh, but generally they aren't. But in the Baroque time period, they almost always were. And it's sort of weird to think of now because classical musicians are relatively scared of improvising. They want to play the notes on the page. But to do it properly in the Baroque era, you would know that when you're playing a solo, you're going to have a chance to make stuff up and play it for the audience. Kind of a neat thing that 
I don't know. I personally wish we would do more of it, but you know, we don't. So Baroque music, we have combinations of long, fast notes, right? Lots of long melodies with lots of notes. Plus you have this newfound use of a home key, right? Writing in a key signature. Plus you have all these trills and you have these ornaments and these improvisations and these decorations, plus all of these things. And it leads to some of the most complex music that's composed for about 200 years. It's not until the late 1800s that composers start to really experiment again with harmony. So this is a really neat time period for music because we're learning how to write and then we sort of take it to an extreme. And that's how we get the misshapen pearl concept. And then we sort of have to scale it back. I guess the last big question is, all right, so that's what the music, that's why we're writing the music. We know why the, what the music is going to sound like. Who are the people that are writing the music? And in 150 years, 1600 to 1750, there are lots of famous Baroque composers. And probably if you talk to anybody on the street, the most famous Baroque composers, they're actually going to come from the end of the Baroque time period, which makes sense because they have 100 years of innovations and inventions to work with, and it's going to make their music sound uh, the most complex and the best. So that makes sense. But who were the people in the early Baroque time period? And that's from about 1600 to 1650. Uh, we have a lot of people, but we'll just mention three very briefly. We have Jean-Baptiste Lully, who was a French composer and also basically considered one of the very first conductors. He was starting to get these big groups together and organize the music, and he would lead the music, and he would have to lead all these people. Um, back then, conducting was done with a big stick that you would pound on the floor. And oddly enough, this was the way Lil Lee died. He was banging his conducting stick on the ground. He accidentally hit his foot. His foot got gangrene and he died. So it was a conducting related injury that brought down Lil Lee. But very famous, very important. We also have uh, Girolamo Frescobaldi, an Italian keyboard virtuoso. And he started to develop a lot of work for the harpsichord and eventually the clavichord that would inspire other people to come, like Paco Bell and Bach. And we have Claudio Monteverdi. And um, he's important because, yes, he was a composer, but he was also one of the first people to start writing down music theory. He was starting to use the basso continuo, and he made comparisons between this new style that was happening in the Baroque versus the old style from the Renaissance. So Monteverdi's music has elements of both, and he literally wrote about it for other people to learn and to develop and to continue using, which is exactly what happened. Next, we get to the Middle Baroque time period. So about 1650 to about 1700. And we get people that, if you're a musician, you're probably going to recognize these names a little bit more. We have Arcangelo Corelli. Uh, he invents something called a concerto grosso, which is basically an orchestra and a concerto mixed up all together. So you have a big orchestra, and then instead of just one soloist, like a concerto, there would be one or two soloists from each section. So you'd have violin, viola, cello, bass, for example, and then you'd have a violin one solo, a violin two solo, a viola solo, a cello solo. And sometimes you'd have everybody playing, sometimes you'd have just the orchestra, and sometimes you'd have that four-person like string quartet. And so that's called a concerto grosso, literally a big concerto. So he develops a bunch of new styles. There's Johann Pachelbel. Um, didn't do crazy. He didn't invent anything, but wrote lots of music. And very famously, he wrote uh, his canon in D, played at many weddings around the world. Um, cellist, not very impressed with his four-note bass line because that bass line stays the same uh, throughout the entire piece. You get to play it like 64 times or something ridiculous like that. Uh, but he does have a lot of wonderful music out there, even though uh, cellist would probably want to argue. Uh, I already mentioned Francois Coupron. Uh, he was also a keyboard player um, from France, and he was one of the people who really innovated the trill. And he, um, if you've ever played a trill, you may have been told to start your trill from above. That's because of Coupron. That was his idea. And if you listen to all of Coupron's trills, they will all start from above. And then everyone else in the broke time period did what he did because he was sort of like the trill master. Uh, there was a family called the Marcello family, which had uh, nobles and also uh, noble nobility, like law people, but also many composers. 
there's Alessandro Marcello, there's Benedetto Marcello. Uh, they started focusing a little bit more on melody. Okay, well, we don't have to have 16th notes all of the time, do we? Um, and cellists are more impressed by this rather than just playing eight notes. You know, you get big melodies. And the last person we'll talk about, again, there's dozens, is Henry Purcell. He's an English composer who sort of leads the way with opera. So if you imagine a play where you have drama and action, people with lines going through a story, but you accompany that with music, and then also the people that are on stage are singing, that's opera. And Purcell writes many of these, and they become very, very popular, and they're popular in Italy and, and France and England and all over the place. Uh, but Purcell is one of the people who actually starts this and gets this going and makes it a very popular art form, which will lead us to the end of the Baroque time period, which is known as the High Baroque. And there are many composers that most people will know and recognize, but we'll touch on four very briefly. There is Vivaldi. Um, he was called the redheaded priest because he was a priest with red hair. So not very inventive nickname, but he's known as the redheaded priest. He actually taught at an all girls school. So he had an orchestra that he worked with every week. And so that's why he was able to write so many concertos and so many pieces of music is that he had an orchestra sort of built into his job. So he wrote lots of things. He really helped the violin concerto take off. There's George Philip Telemann. Um, a very prolific composer, which means he wrote lots and lots and lots of things. And he wrote a little bit of everything. Um, he even wrote for viola. Woohoo! Shout out to violas. And um, actually was friends with a lot of the people around at this time. Uh, Bach and Telemann were friends. Bach made Telemann his uh, godfather for his son, C.P.E. Bach. Um, so Telemann's a very important figure. George Frederick Handel, uh, born in Germany, lived a lot in England. And again, he wrote lots and lots of things. He wrote operas. He wrote oratorios, which would be like opera, but no action. So like just a bunch of people singing a story at you rather than acting out a story. And he also wrote lots of instrumental music as well. And he starts to develop these large groups into what eventually become symphony orchestras. And that's also helped along by another guy, J.S. Bach. And he is so important that he sort of gets his own little section because Bach is the master composer of the Baroque era. And you have to be careful because he has like 23 kids and some of them go into music too. But uh, J.S. Bach, when we say Bach, we mean Johann Sebastian Bach. He works at churches for most of his life. So he had music to write all the time. Every week he would write new music. And he had an organ at his disposal. So he wrote lots of organ music. He wrote lots of church uh, hymns. And he was writing like, you know, every week for church services, for big services, for small services. And a lot of the hymns that we know today come from him. Four-part harmony, we still sing them, we still play them, we still use them in orchestras. And Bach is sort of a big deal for that reason. But he also writes music that's not specifically for the church, even though he did say that all the music that he wrote did come from a divine source. So among his secular classical music, were pieces for solo violin and solo cello, so no accompaniment whatsoever, just them playing by themselves like a harpsichord word, wood or a lute wood. Uh, he wrote for small orchestras. He wrote for large orchestras. He wrote for orchestras with soloists, uh, orchestras with groups of soloists, harpsichords by themselves, organs by themselves, choirs, and basically anything else he could get his hands on. And he didn't invent anything like the Concerto Grosso, but everything he did was amazing. It was done at the highest level of technical expertise for the time, the highest level of compositional expertise. He's kind of it. You know, he is really a quite a big deal. He standardized this writing. He takes what Handel was doing and he makes them bigger. So we have the, the Brandenburg Concerti. Uh, there are six of them. Uh, there are soloists. There's an orchestra. It's a bigger orchestra than had been put together at the time. Um, he's doing new things and, well, not new things, but he's using the techniques in a new way. So he's writing pieces for violin and for cello by themselves. He composes a set of preludes and fugues in every key. Remember, this is a big deal because before 1600, you couldn't do that and it would sound good. But with this equal temperament, with this well temperament or in a well tempered clavier, we could do that. So Bach takes advantage of these new keys. So there you go. So what's so impressive? What makes all of this stuff a notch above everybody else? Well, he had an ability to write long, elaborate, beautiful melodies with bass lines that would weave through many keys 
with the melody. So again, just because he's able to do it, he starts to do it. And with an organ, imagine that, right? You have a left hand, which does bass lines, and then you have your foot pedals too. So that's pretty killer, pretty neat thing that Bach can do. So he's taking a melody and a bass line, and he puts them in the same melody. Now for keyboard instruments, not a big deal. You have two hands, five, uh, five fingers on each hand, 10 fingers, not a big deal. But if you're playing on a violin or a cello or a flute or a trumpet, jumping back and forth from an upper octave to a lower octave to be able to play a melody and then a bass part, that's pretty tricky. And then Bach would just be a little bit extra and add a layer or two or three layers to his melody, which is outrageously difficult for these other instruments that aren't keyboard instruments. He would almost like hear a symphony piece playing in his head and then write it for a cello or write it for a violin, which is very difficult to do well. And then on top of it, Bach would sometimes take these melodies and play them back to back so they would be an echo of itself, sometimes in the same key, sometimes a different key. And that's the last piece of Bach's puzzle is his ability to write fugues. What is a fugue? Well, it's like a fancy cannon. What's a cannon? Well, it's like a fancy round. And I think we know what rounds are. A round is a short, simple melody that if you sing it as a harmony to itself, just at starting at a different time, it sounds good. So it's like a melody and harmony rolled into one. You just have to start at a different time. A lot of us know Ferro Jaca. A lot of us know Row, Row, Row Your Boat. So like, <sighs> row, row, row your boat. Gently row, down row, the stream, row your boat. Merrily, Gently merrily, merrily, stream. merrily, life merrily, is merrily, but a merrily, dream. merrily, life is but a dream. And you sing it back to back to back to back to back as many times as you want. You get a harmony that sounds good. And that's a neat thing. And that's around. So if you take that, you make it a little bit more complex with the melody and you add a bass line. That will create something called a canon. It's so like Pachelbel's canon in D. The bass line stays the same the entire time throughout, but now you have longer melodies that fit over top of the chords that are going to be created with the bass line. So that's a canon. So if you take that and then change keys while you're doing it, that's called a fugue. So now your melody comes in in one key, and when it's repeated a second time, it's now in a new key. So this is really complicated, really quickly. And you can go like beyond that. You can get even more complex, which is what Bach does. He would write two different melodies. You'd play them each separately and they would be in different keys or not, but more often than not, they would change keys. And then what he would do is he would actually write two melodies. So it's not just one melody anymore. It's two melodies. And then there's the melody itself. You can take that subject or the melody and just repeat it like you do with row, 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 your boat. But you could also take it and write it backwards. So just like start at the end of the melody and play instead of left to right, play it right to left. So that's an option you can do with these melodies. And Bach would do it. He would write the melody backwards. And then he would say, oh, well, Let's say the music sort of starts low and then goes up high and then comes back down again. Well, what happens if we start and end on the same notes, but instead of going up by two notes, we go down by two notes. So he would take this music and write it upside down for these melodies. And then you can guess what happens next. You're going to take that melody and turn it upside down. So you can go forward, you can go backwards, you can go upside down, and you can go backwards and upside down. So Big Daddy Bach, and he would do this. He would write quadruple fugues with inverted retrograde, which basically means he's going to have four different melodies, some going forward, some going upside down, some backwards, and some upside down and backwards. And as you do this, there are going to be at least four notes being played at once. And sometimes it'll be in the original key, like maybe he starts in D major, but sometimes those notes aren't going to be in D major. Remember, because these are complex and they're changing keys as they go. So as far as harmony goes, this is wild and crazy. People don't write this difficult and complex for years and years and years. And Bach would do it on a weekly basis. And so if you start thinking about it that way, you have all these new and distinct harmonies being created. And then on top of it, you have all these trills and ornamentations 
no wonder people looked at it and went, oh, man, that's all extra. That's like a pretty pearl, but it's all messed up. It's a misshapen pearl. How Barocco. So there you go. He sort of sums up all of this Baroque just because he is so amazing with his compositions. His vision was such that he could do all of this all at once. And that's why he's the master composer of the Baroque era. But it has to end at some point. And uh, we usually say the Baroque time period ends in 1750, which, oddly enough, is the year that Bach dies. And at this time, uh, composers are going, okay, well, let's, uh, let, let's maybe scale it back a bit. Let's take the harmony, you know, starting and ending in a key. That's good. That's good. Uh, we like this instrumental music. That's good. We'll keep that. Uh, ooh, uh, having action on stage. Uh, having these operas, we'll keep that too. We'll do that. Ooh, and new instruments are being made. Yeah, we'll combine all these things. But you know, let's maybe dance a little bit less. We can still write dance music, but you know, since we're writing more complex music that you don't want to dance to, we just won't dance with the people. That's okay. We'll just make complex dance music, and people will go, "Oh, I don't want to dance to that. I'll just listen to it." And all these trills. Yeah, we can do with less of those. Maybe just trill at the end of the phrase, or maybe if a soloist is doing a cadenza, okay, you can trill there. But they scale it back. And all these fugues, yeah, we, we got to stop that because there's just too much going on. And yes, all this stuff is used as time goes on. But in the immediate time period right after the broke, we sort of stay away from that. We want things to be a little bit more simple. But that's a whole big topic for another day. So we'll stick to Baroque and say, that's it. The Baroque time period is over 400 years old um, from the time we're doing this now. So it's pretty amazing to think that in 400 years, this music is still being played and is still a huge inspiration for so many composers in the classical music world and even in jazz, especially in jazz, actually, and even in heavy metal music. The band Metallica used to listen to a lot of Bach. Uh, alternate music uh, like Muse, they take cues from Bach's Saccade and Fugue in D minor to write some of their guitar music. Um, it's still a huge influence today. It gives us a lot of things that turn into what we consider classical music. We have chord progressions and the building of traditional harmony using key signatures. We combine string families, woodwind families, and metal brass instruments, and that gives us symphony orchestras eventually. And then we take these collection of slow and fast and slow and fast and slow and fast alternating dance pieces. We put them together as suites, and that eventually turns into symphonies. And we pair soloists with instruments like a basso continuo for a sonata or with a, uh, an orchestra to make concertos. So we get a lot of these things that turn into other things like opera, where we're combining symphony orchestras with action on stage. And, you know, if you just have a bunch of people singing a story at you without the action, that's an oratorio, oratorio we get those too. Um, so the Baroque time period gives us a lot that we think of today as classical music. It starts in the Baroque time period. It's so important. So what to listen to? There's hundreds of composers. There's 150 years of history to listen to. Who to listen to? Well, here were the four composers that we talked about in the high Baroque time period. Obviously, listen to everybody else and everything else, too. Uh, Bach has over a thousand compositions. Um, as mentioned, the unaccompanied violin pieces, the unaccompanied cello pieces are to this day, some of the most difficult pieces for those instruments. Um, a lot of cellists won't even play his fifth suite just because it is so difficult, even 400 years later. Uh, Bach writes a lot for the organ, not just hymns, but concert pieces for the organ. His famous Toccata and Fugue in D minor. Uh, it's a big famous piece around Halloween. Uh, the Little Fugue in G minor is very famous. That's been written out for orchestras as well. Uh, he has the Brandenburg concertos. Uh, he wrote a really big famous mass in B minor. He writes concertos for instruments. So important. If you don't know Bach, go listen to him. If you're in the Suzuki books, of course, you're playing Bach all over the place. The minuets, um, the concerto in A minor for the violinist, um, the double concerto, super important. Bach, ah, ah, so important. Vivaldi, the red-headed priest, uh, over 500 concertos that he wrote uh, for many string instruments. Also wrote for oboe and mandolin and, and lots of different things. Uh, the Four Seasons is famous. He also writes church music like the Gloria. That's really famous. Telemann, over 3,000 composition. And you thought Bach did a lot. Telemann, 
very, very prolific. Uh, he was the guy that did viola stuff. Uh, he wrote operas. He wrote oratorios. The story of Don Quixote. Um, sort of the guy that went and chased windmills, if you know that story. Um, Telemann, lots of things. I only listed two things there because how are you going to list 3,000 things? So much. Handel, not as impressive, right? Only 300 compositions, but they were all extremely substantial. He has the water music, three different ones of those. Music for the Royal Fireworks. Uh, one of the first times that fireworks was, was brought to Europe, he wrote music for it. Uh, he has an oratorio called The Messiah, uh, which is very, very long, but it tells the whole story basically of uh, the New Testament. Um, at the end of the second part is the Hallelujah Chorus, which is super famous. Almost everyone is going to know that one. He also writes Concerto Grosso, uh, just like Corelli did. He writes opera. He writes more oratorios. Um, Handel, very big, important name in the Baroque time period. So there's so much to listen to. There's so much to find. There's so much to play. There's so much to trill to. Um, but we'll sort of cut it off here because if you were to take a college class in music history, the Baroque time period takes months to go through. And we just got through it rather quickly. So there you go. Happy listening to the misshapen pearl sounds of the Baroque time period. Very, very important. So moving on thanks so much for your time if you would please grab your instruments and we'll move on to the symphonia in d while not baroque does have a few elements of the baroque time period think of violins uh violin ones measure 24 and you get it later on you get trills in the middle of the melody um you get a lot of 16th notes so elements of the baroque time period are used later and uh, that's more about what we'll talk about next week. But go ahead, find the Sinfonia in D, and I will turn things over, and I'll catch you next week. Happy playing.